Off a day, the Committee on General Government Operations, Appropriations, and Housing is now called to order. For the record, today is Thursday, June 3rd, 2021, and the time now is 3.01 p.m. Notices for this budget hearing were disseminated via email to all senators and all main media broadcasting outlets. First public notice was issued on Wednesday, May 26th of 2021. The second notice was issued on Tuesday, June 1st of 2021. The committee will now hear and accept testimony on Bill 55-36-COR, the Fiscal Year 2022 Appropriations Act, as requested by the Governor relative to the Office of Technology for their Fiscal Year 2022 budget request. I'd like to acknowledge the Senator's presence today, Vice Speaker Tina Munya barnes Senator Tony Atta, Senator Joanne Brown, and Senator Tello Taitigui. Thank you, colleagues, for joining us this afternoon. Just again, a reminder in the general rules for the public hearing, those testifying on behalf of Bill Number 5536-COR relative to the Office of Technology are invited to the panel. Written testimonies shall be submitted to the committee. Please provide legislative staff with your written testimony for photocopying. Testimony may be read and lengthy. Testimony should be summarized to about five minutes. Those testifying will be allowed to present oral testimony. Once you're done, please remain in the room for questions or for additional testimony as may be desired by members of the committee. Question and testimony shall be confined to the substance or nature of the agenda. Personal inferences to the character or motive of any senator or any individuals testifying is not permitted. Any violations of this general rule of conduct will result in removal from the budget hearing by myself, the chairman. Proper form and decorum shall be practiced by all present in the public hearing room for this proceeding. Individuals who fail to maintain proper form and decorum may be restricted from providing oral testimony and or may be asked to leave or be escorted and be removed from the room. When you speak, please make sure that the microphone is on and that you speak into the microphone. For the purpose of these budget hearings, questions or comments from the Committee on Appropriations will be given two rounds with each member allotted four minutes. Other questions may be submitted to the committee for submission to the agency or the department for responses. When you begin your testimony, please state your name and your title for the record. At this time, I ask the panel members from the Office of Technology to rise and for our Sergeant at Arms to please swear them in. Under penalty of perjury, do you affirm that all information they provide today, whether it be in writing, verbally, or electronically, be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God. Mr. Chair, he's under oath. You may proceed. Thank you, Sergeant at Arms. We'll now begin this hearing on Bill Number 55-36-COR, Committee on Rules, by request of Imagahagan Guahan, the Governor of Guam, in accordance with the Organic Act of Guam, an act making appropriations for the operations of the executive branch of the government of Guam for fiscal year ending September 30, 2022, making other appropriations and establishing miscellaneous and administrative provisions relative to the Office of Technology. And we'll begin with Mr. Frank Lujan from the Office of Technology. Mr. Lujan, you may begin with your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Chairman. Uh, Senator Adams, Senator Brown, Senator uh, Tello Taitigui, uh, and um, Senator Vice Speaker Tina Munya Barnes. Thank you for the opportunity to present our FY22 budget. I do have a, uh, a slide presentation uh, I'd like to uh, start out with. Uh, although it's about 50 some slides, it's, uh, it won't take us that long to get through all of that. So, so I'll go ahead and, and start. Please proceed. Okay, so a little bit about the Office of Technology. If we go into uh, who we are, uh, initially we started out as, uh, you know, uh, back in the in the in the 70s and 60s, we we're known as the Data Processing Division under the uh, Department of Administration. Later on, uh, their name changed to uh, the Bureau of Information Technology, and uh, today. Um, we are now the Office of Technology. We're actually the newest department within the government of Guam. Uh, we started, we became a department in October of 2018. And uh, most of the guidance for our, uh, our office is codified in uh, 5 GCA Chapter 1, Article 12. 
So uh, a little bit of our mission statement. We have our mission statement. It's actually published on our website. I won't go, since I have a number of slides, I won't go through this uh, in detail, but uh, uh, we do have a published mission statement. Uh, we have our core values that are in place for our personnel and how we, uh, how we uh, kind of surround our actions. And then uh, we have strategic goals that we actually, um, you know, can actually stick by as we, we've moved within the last few years. Uh, there's a one, two, about, there's about five or six goals in here that will, will, will be um, delving into a little bit of the tactics on these goals uh, in, in the latter part of this presentation. So organizationally, I just wanted to introduce you to, the, to our team. Uh, we're a small team. On the staffing pattern, uh, there's a, a total of 16 individuals that are listed there. Um, the, we're divided up into the operations and the system support side. You'll see we have about four people in the operations side and altogether uh, eight personnel in the system support group. Uh, the kind of the greenish light uh, color delineates or we're recruiting for that particular position. Uh, we also have, uh, we recently brought on two uh, special projects coordinators and have, uh, they're working with us in the, in the cybersecurity side of our, uh, um, of our operations. Uh, additional team members include other IT personnel that are out in public health as well as uh, the Department of Revenue and Taxation. Uh, we recently took on, because of COVID, we, have, uh, we actually have uh, temporary employees that are actually assisting us in a lot of the deployments that were going out there. So we have altogether uh, six additional uh, temporary personnel that uh, we've been uh, leveraging with the Department of Labor. Now going on to our, you know, our, our services profile, uh, the Office of Technology provides IT security services and support to over 40 line departments, commissions, and, and boards. Um, these are, in, in this next slide, we, we have the different facets of how we support them. These are all common uh, entry points from access control to telecom, email, and all of it encompasses uh, this, the realm of, uh, of course, the never-ending realm of cybersecurity. Uh, the different departments, uh, these are kind of the core planning departments, uh, finance, admin, and planning, there's 10 of them. Um, going down to the health side, uh, there's four, including the largest department, which is the Department of Public Health and, and Social Services. Uh, on the public safety side, we have eight departments that we support, all the way from GPD all the way down to um, the uh, Department of Military Affairs and uh, Guam Homeland Security. And then lastly, there's uh, 19 other key agencies from the governor's office down to one of the newest ones, uh, the Guam Recovery Office. Altogether, there's over 3,000 endpoints. These, are, these represent the different users that we support out there. If you have a desktop or a laptop uh, and you're connected to our network, we, we support that, that connection. So moving on, uh, activities and initiatives that, that are always ongoing. Uh, I, in terms of the base initiatives that we have, uh, we're always looking to improve our cybersecurity posture. That's a, literally a, almost a 24-7 uh, operations. Uh, we have a number of partners, including uh, the Center for Internet Security, the um, Department of Homeland Security in the, in the, with the federal government, CISA, who's a cybersecurity infrastructure and uh, um, security agency. Uh, and the other uh, partner we have is also with the FBI. Uh, we're also looking to build 
more of our broadband efficiencies through modernization. That's the connectivity within our networks. Um, we're also developing relevant uh, smart apps. One of the two recent development uh, apps that we've uh, we put out there is the, the Guam COVID alert, as well as the recently la announced last week, uh, the, the TOCA app we're actually hosting. Uh, other initiatives include the development and promotion of online citizen-centric applications, such as the, uh, for example, the, the vehicle registration renewals. Uh, the other last initiatives here, we, we're looking and analyzing a lot of our workloads to see where it's relevant to move into uh, cloud environments. And lastly, we have uh, hardening uh, of our core IT infrastructure. So on this particular slide under the uh, weekly report, these are the things that we're, we're literally doing on a daily basis. This is one of, these are more uh, recent projects that we're working on and these are active and ongoing. I'm not going to any one of these uh, directly, but since you have uh, a copy of my presentation, I'll be more than glad to answer any entertain any questions after this presentation. Past significant events include, um, as you know, um, a few weeks ago we had a major core fiber cut where uh, a number, most of our line agencies were actually down. Um, other events include uh, just a lot of these, um, these uh, items on this list is the hardening of, that we're actively doing on our, on our network. Upcoming and significant events, uh, of course, includes this public hearing. Uh, we are looking at launching our uh, uh, high-speed fiber going into the, the GPD precincts, hoping to build more efficiencies on their existing networks. Um, we also announced the uh, public notices portal. And, uh, of course, there's uh, the American Rescue Plan that we're we're still actually working with the, the governor's office on. Uh, and then lastly, uh, we're taking a hard look at, um, you know, our, the, the structure and the location of our, our current data center. Issues of concern. Uh, really, the, the first I put on the list as a result of our fiber cut is uh, looking at redundancy in our network. Uh, we were down for about 12 full hours, and uh, we're hoping to kind of bridge that and uh, improve on uh, uh, that, that kind of outage. Uh, Cybersecurity is, is always on our mind as far as uh, assuring that uh, the databases and our networks are secure. Um, one of the more recent uh, subjects is the digital health pass that we're looking at different co platforms that are being offered out there. It's a big concern to us because this is a, an emerging technology. It's not exactly mature, so there's um, a lot of uh, vendors and opportunities that are, that are kind of knocking on our door to look at their products. And uh, hopefully, if we, uh, as we evaluate these, uh, these products and services, we'll, we'll be able to um, look for a good fit for uh, the recovery of uh, Guam's economy. Um, number four on this is the, the Firm 400 Maintenance, our financial management system. That's a major exposure right now because we we haven't had maintenance on that system for uh, a number of years and we're, we're looking at trying to get that back in line. And then lastly, uh, just the, the resources, our workforce resources are still uh, severely short uh, in comparison to the kind of workloads that we have out there. Uh, these are kind of uh, different things that I'm working on. Uh, I'm actually working on the cannabis RFP. I've actually moved it forward to uh, uh, Department of Public Health uh, for, for approval and uh, getting them to move that uh, particular opportunity forward. Uh, I'm also presently evaluating the uh, FMIS RFP as well as a, uh, you know, a telecom RFP coming out of uh, BSP. Um, just kind of skipping down to the last few. 
I just recently became a member of the Submarine Cable Task Force as a result of a public law announced in December. And so we had our first meeting last, last month. And um, uh, being a member of that work group, we're, we're looking at how uh, you know, the different fiber uh, drops and landings coming into the, the island can, uh, uh, we're actually evaluating you know, uh, the different aspects of how that can uh, to help the, the public and uh, as well as the, the economy. And then lastly, uh, we're, we're looking at reviving these, uh, these applications that are helpful with GPD and the uh, Office of, or the Highway Safety in, in, in getting their grants. So I'm actually evaluating a, a, a scope of work for uh, getting this application back online. So on to our budget submission. Um, there's, in the personnel services side, uh, we have salaries that are over uh, 900,000 or, and then the benefits coming out over 300,000 at a total of 1.2 million uh, just for the salaries. Uh, this is for the, the 16 personnel that we have on, uh, on the staffing pattern today. In operations, under contractual, we have about a million dollars for uh, our contractual services, uh, supplies and materials at, at 25,000 for a total of about a million dollars altogether. On the contractual side, it, it actually covers uh, different software licenses, uh, hardware maintenance and support. Um, and just there, there's a whole list that's actually been submitted as part of my submission. Uh, utilities are coming on at about 277,000 for both power, water, and phone. And then lastly, uh, our total budget submission is about 2.6. That's uh, significantly down from, uh, you know, a few years ago where we had a, a, a budget of over uh, $3 million. So lastly, I want to kind of round out the last part of my presentation to uh, what I call the the vision for the future and, and the emphasis is on our not only the expansion of our workforce but also uh, looking at our data center uh, this, these are some renditions that we're kind of I'm actually looking at and uh, this first one is kind of a conceptual design of how the the data center would look this particular data center actually has three um, three actual uh, enclosed and separate data centers internally. Uh, going on to the next slide, uh, you can see another view here. Uh, we, we're uh, focused on sustainability, so you'll see a number of uh, solar panels here in the, in the field array. And then uh, uh, this is kind of a night view of our, of our data center. And lastly, this is the floor plan. And as we go into the floor plan, um, this I'm zooming in on the different data centers. We currently have three uh, separate entities, which include uh, our main data center with, then there's the DRT's data center. And until the fire, we had uh, public health as a separate data center. And these are all now uh, consolidated all the, and they have all separate accesses and separate um, uh, circuitry to kind of uh, comply with their uh, um, uh, requirements. Uh, this next area here that we're gonna zoom in uh, actually is the, the work area. This is enough work area for about 60 personnel altogether, including training room and, and common areas. And then the, that's the uh, solar panel array on the side. So I know it said there's 50 slides here. We just went through the, the 50 slides and uh, uh, I'd like to go ahead and uh, open up to any questions. Thank you, Mr. Lujan. Uh, yes, we'll begin the question and comment portion now, beginning with uh, your oversight chair, Vice Speaker, Tina Munya Barnes. Jesus Masi, uh, Mr. Chair, thank you for giving me the opportunity to open up the line of questions, and thank you, Mr. Lahan, for your presentation today. And I know that uh, as we move forward with technology, we know that technology is changing 
at a very rapid uh, speed. And what may be good today may not be so well tomorrow because it just keeps changing. And I have a couple of questions and I uh, hope you can help me answer them. Uh, over the last uh, few months, uh, I, I have been looking at implementing uh, automation uh, government-wide. And uh, I have seen the results from a case study from the Guam Power Authority uh, where it has improved uh, efficiency by 90%. How can we implement this government-wide automation? Uh, well, uh, first of all, uh, thank you for that question, uh, Senator, Senator Wynja Barnes. Uh, the, um, that's actually a good question on how to implement it. Uh, the, the, uh, the automation or the, uh, like, I believe it's, it, that particular methodology is called RPA. Uh, there's a number of processes where it, it can apply uh, in terms of, um, you know, uh, how, for example, uh, processes are um, different process cycles, including, for example, uh, I'd say, for example, the, uh, the way permits are, are processed, that, that, that could be a possibility. Um, the, right now, that's, that's something we really need to move a little further into, into depth and, and bringing some consultants on to actually look at where it can apply in different areas of the government. Um, I know that uh, the, the, what I hope to have is uh, you know, an opportunity to budget, budget more to bring somebody on board that can help us identify the different areas. Thank you. Um, I understand that OTEC has planned to invest $13 million through the uh, American Rescue Plan to modernize Gulf Guam. Can you share uh, with us your, your plans to this effect? Uh, well, actually, with that particular number, the, that's something that the governor is, is still working on. That's not something that I'm really at liberty to share to any uh, specific details and she, until she makes a final decision. Has she given you a timeline to that, Frank, and as far as um, the, working the with this credit? My, my understanding of the timelines is that they're right now evaluating the Treasury guidance to assure whatever we had in our plans aligns with that guidance, and that that isn't out yet. And uh, so uh, I'm really, the answer to the question on that, on any of the final numbers of what we submitted is really uh, at the, you know, the discretion of the governor right now. Okay. Um, recently, uh, news articles have reported that uh, foreign entities have managed to hack our government servers. What protocols do you have to identify these threats? And how do we ensure that government services and protected information are not compromised? I know we talked about this earlier, but if you could share that. Well, well thank you for that question. Uh, first, just for clarification, um, we actually were never hacked uh, at the time. The, uh, what had happened through our, our cyber partners is that we identified a vulnerability in in our systems and our products and specifically in our, our email servers. So when we, once we identified the vulnerability, uh, we studied what actions we had to take to, to apply um, the patches and the fixes that were put out by uh, the vendor. And so uh, in that event, that, that particular event, once we identified because it took us really uh, quite a bit of time just to work through the patch and get it downloaded, uh, we had to take the action of taking the servers down until the patches were in place uh, to avoid being, being attacked only because uh, it became really public that uh, this particular vulnerability was an actual um, state-sponsored uh, vulnerability and uh, uh, we didn't want to take any chances. The, at the time we implemented uh, or actually took the system down, there was already over 60,000 penetrations outside of us uh, in, in, at different organizations, different countries. And so because it was 
spreading so rapidly, I made the decision to take it down for a few days until we instituted the patch. But at any one time, we were not attacked. We had no, you know, we weren't actually, uh, uh, our systems were not penetrated. And we, we constantly monitor for, for any kind of penetrations that we can, we can detect. Thank you. Um, with the increased use of technology in our government, uh, can you share with us a little about your staffing and, and if there is a capacity to handle the needs of a 21st century government uh, within, the, within OTEC? in as far as your, your uh, staffing? Well, uh, first of all, what I want to do first is to kind of actually acknowledge the men and women of the Office of Technology. They have been uh, uh, very diligent and um, in terms of uh, um, working together in the midst of this, uh, this global pandemic, pandemic overall. Uh, we've had a number of challenges. Uh, we have quite a, f a small staff for handling over, you know, 3,000 end users, as well as uh, just the challenge of uh, meeting some of the um, some of the objectives and deploying, uh, you know, um, systems uh, that allow for, uh, you know, teleworking and that kind of thing. So, uh, in terms of just overall and summarizing our our, our current staff, it's it's really insufficient. It's a big concern. For me, uh, in addressing our, you know, our 21st century challenges, uh, you know, the the investments have to be made uh, not only in the hardware and the software side of things, but they also have to be made um, in, with the people. Uh, Guam is not the only one that has this shortfall. I've studied other other states and other territories. They have the same relative problems. We we happen just to be um, smaller. Than, than most, and but we have the same. We face the same challenges from a cybersecurity standpoint, and uh, just even from a just the ever-changing environment. One of the biggest changes that we're we're, we're trying to align ourselves with uh, since the recent pipeline uh, attack in in the mainland is, um, you know, President Biden's new um, cybersecurity executive order. It's per quite comprehensive and. I'm sure a lot of states and territories will have to align with the, the changes that are going to be instituted with that uh, executive order. Uh, we need to figure out how to echo that because uh, we are we are small, and, and uh, until we were able to expand, um, it's going to be you know we're going to continue to be challenged, but uh, we'll we'll we're, we're prepared to work with the governor work with our cabinet work as well as working with the legislature to kind of actually meet those. And so as I, you know, uh, in my presentation, I had the vision of a new data center. That's, that's, uh, that's our focal point of how um, I'd like to, you know, uh, recruit people who are really mindful about uh, bringing out and securing data that, especially locally, to, uh, for, for our island citizens. Thank you very much. And, and lastly, Mr. Chair, if I may, um, we talk about uh, specialized training uh, for police officers, firefighters, and all these niche positions. Do we um, have, Frank, the capacity in Guam to train individuals who want to explore a career in technology? Or do we need to engage with the uh, Guam Community College and the UOG to start building capacity here? Well, in terms of training, there's all different dimensions that are out there, from online training to the Guam County College. There's 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 so many different resources. Uh, uh, the island itself has uh, a number of very very talented people that I'm sure uh, when we when we get into the mode where we we will uh, be recruiting, um, I know that there would be pe uh, people who. Could uh, could qualify to work for the Office of Technology, and uh, training overall is is something that's uh, that's always concurrent. Every day we're training. Every day we're learning new things, uh, whether it's something we're doing online or if it's or or bringing in a training session. But um, 
uh, we, we do our best uh, uh, internally to, to stay current, but uh, we, still have, we still need to work to where we have um, you know, investments in place so, th so that we can afford to, to better train and, and stay current. Thank you, uh, Mr. Director, for that. Um, Mr. Chair, that's all the questions. I, I might have a follow-up, but I'll go ahead and listen to my, the rest of my colleagues. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. I just have a few questions before uh, I move on to the, our other colleagues. Uh, Mr. Lujan, can you describe uh, for us a little bit of uh, how OTEC provides uh, services, specifically how OTEC helps um, other government agencies to upgrade their systems or to integrate new systems? That's, uh, that's kind of a wide question because uh, one of the challenges we have, of course, is the fact that we have 40 different, 40 different line agencies, which means you have not only 40 different lines of business, but when you go to, into those different departments, they have multiple lines of businesses, especially if you go into our largest department, the Department of, of um, Public Health and Social Services. Uh, they have everything from immunization to their labs to the SNAP program and WIC. So those are multiple, multiple those are multiple different, you know, lines of business that we we do support. Um, once they're up online, we do, our, our systems run the operations. We our personnel go in and actually assure the operations are run on a on either a, a daily, monthly, or a weekly basis. So we have a number, literally hundreds of applications that are out there that we we support. So um, when when I start with the largest one, which is Department of Public Health and Social Services, that's a very very wide. Um, you know, angle of support is not only on the software and application side, but it's also in the desktop deployment side, the laptop deployment side, and and the, and the security and the access, the credentials. Um, it's again, it's it's a number of uh, you know, it's just a plethora of uh, different activities that we have to work to to actually support these different entities, and and that's not only the public health; it's also uh, Department of Revenue and Taxation. It's our personnel that actually runs all the checks that get mailed out to, um, you know, to all the, the the population, whether it's a stimulus or whether it's refunds or, um, you know, uh, we're we're all part of that operation. It's our it's our systems, it's our network, it's our personnel that that support this. Um, when you look at the the mobile uh, laptops that are out there in the different the GPD's 28 beats that are out there. Um, it's our systems that are, are supporting that, uh, that network and our law enforcement. Um, our email systems, we have three different platforms that are out there. We're working on unifying them. That's all part of, again, the, the support of keeping them all together. And then ultimately, when you look at uh, amidst COVID, we, we had, like everybody else, we all had to learn to, you know, video conference and uh, use applications like Microsoft Teams and Zoom and, uh, and Google Meets. Those, you know, uh, before COVID, uh, those weren't really uh, tools that were used very much. And now we use it twice, three, four times a day. Um, those, most people don't really understand the part that we, we supply the network. So when you see that, um, you know, whether it's governor that's uh, um, giving her address to the people or we're, we're uh, communicating via Zoom internally, it's our networks that are um, securely bringing that signal to, to each one of the, the, you know, the desktops and the laptops and the mobile devices that are out there. So it's, again, it's uh, the Office of Technology provides a wide array of services and uh, I can tell you that our team just doesn't specialize on one thing. It's everything. And so I only mentioned a few, not even to mention, you know, the fact that we run the payroll on the financial management system. Uh, every, every employee that, that gets paid are, are coming from our systems and, 
and uh, we ramp up uh, uh, every two weeks to to run those or you know run that application uh, at the um, Department of Administration. So I hope that kind of answered your question. I know I didn't cover everything that we no, did. No, that's that's good. That's Thank still, you. That I I can I can speak a lot to what we do. Um, from a technology standpoint for the, for the government. And it sounds like uh, some of your workload increased as a result of the pandemic as more agencies were forced to do more things online, virtually, remotely, et cetera? Yes. All right, what, can you uh, explain your, what, what OTEC's role is in the maintenance of the AS400 system? Uh, it's, it's a key role in terms of maintenance. Really, our, our side is really to support the hardware and assure that it's it's up and running. Um, the the piece of hardware that we have is actually fairly complex and it actually is state of the art. Um, the uh, it is due for an upgrade. Uh, we haven't upgraded it in about uh, six years. Um, our role is is to keep it operational, and so the um, we have a number of production systems that are on the AS400, including public health has their own, the uh, Department of Corrections has uh, their own, uh, what's called a logical partition that runs on the system. The uh, Department of Administration has their financial management system on it. And then uh, two other main core systems include uh, the Department of Public Health with their PH Pro system, and then the, the Department of Revenue and Taxation. Which, uh, which runs all of the tax station. So when you look at those systems, those core systems with re from revenue and tax to Department of Public Health, uh, those are all running on, on the AS400. And, and we're looking to you know, move forward to even modernize uh, uh, the Medicaid applications with the federal government, and that will be on a combination of platforms, including the AS400. Do you guys provide technical assistance to uh, the autonomous agencies as well? I'm sorry? Do you, does OTEC provide technical assistance to the autonomous agencies as well? Uh, there's only one autonomous agency that we actually provide assistance of that I'm aware of, uh, or maybe two. Uh, one is the, um, what is it, the, the Guam Regional Transit Authority, as well as the um, Hagatnya HRA. Renewal and um, excuse me, <coughs> excuse me, restoration authority. Those are the other two. They don't have any IT personnel, so we we come in and we actually assist them. Okay. And uh, what is OTEC's role with the operations and support of the E911 emergency system? Well, uh, other than the the network of. Um, systems that they have up there where um, they're di they monitor and dispatch from. Um, we, don't, we don't directly work with the telecom side, although we do help in providing that side of the service. The, uh, we are on the, on the dispatch. We have applications that aid them in the dispatch side, and that's, that's generally through uh, the uh, the CAD systems that GPD has, and some of the data that we um, we supply the E911 system when it comes to, uh, I'd say, driver's license and vehicle registration information that would, they would need. And uh, did OTEC assist with the procurement of the E911 emergency system? I, I assisted in the approval of the the RFP uh, that went out several years ago for that. Other than that, I was not part of the evaluation team. I, I believe parts of that are actually ongoing, but until the final award is made, um, a, a lot of that process is kept confidential. All right, thank you, Mr. Luhan. I don't have any other questions at this time, and I'll go now to Senator Tello Tadigui. Mr. Chair. Half a day, Frank. Good to see you. I think the last time we paid a visit was, um, you know, before COVID, and 
coming to visit your office and seeing all the um, well, the programs that you have there as well as uh, what, what you have in place. My, my biggest concern too, and I'm glad to hear you're on the uh, fiber optic cable uh, task force, and that's good to hear. But, um, you know, as mentioned earlier with regards to what's happening in the world and, and especially with the gas issue on the hostage of the gas in Virginia and the East Coast, along with a, now just a week ago, about the largest, I think it was a JBS, uh, one of the largest uh, meatpacking companies also got hacked, or I'm not sure if you call it uh, a breach or a hack, or, um, but uh, with all these cyber threats that are going on through the world, and, and we're going more through using technology, and it just opens the door for more, you know, opportunities for uh, hacking or uh, R ransomware is basically when someone is holding ransom on some uh, your 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 program. Or can you just real quickly, what is ransomware? Uh, Senator, thank you for that question. Uh, ransomware is is actually when there is a a, a breach um, that occurs by someone who's, who is, you know, initiates the, the breach. Um, they go in and they do an encryption on, on the databases on that file, on the files that are on your system once they penetrate the systems. Uh, once it's encrypted, um, no one has the key but the person who initiated the encryption, which is the ransomware attacker, the hacker, if you will. So, what they typically do is they they will release they they claim to release the key to you um, if you're able to pay the ransom. Mm -hmm. okay. okay. So we're uh, starting. Yeah, I'm starting to read more more of that. Uh, not just in the states, but we had a uh, same incident that happened at the University of Guam, where there was a breach with a uh, data information. Fortunately, I, I did ask uh, someone there if anything was taken or held hostage to, but they were able to keep everything intact, but that exposed a lot of individual students and people who are part of that system, um, put them in, in exposure. You know, identity theft is also a growing, uh, a growing issue we have, uh, not just here in the U.S., but everywhere around the world. So, you know, there's so many threats that are going on. Does, does government Guam have a cybersecurity incident response plan for the government of Guam if this should happen? Well, in terms of a plan, we have a process. Uh, we, have a, we have a procedure uh, when we detect a breach. Uh, I've exercised it a, a number of times. We have a number of sensors um, in our systems that can detect a breach. And when we, uh, when we find a breach, uh, we have a process where we go in and, and we eliminate the breach and, and uh, go out into the, the field to find it. And, uh, and secure it. So other than, get, I don't get into too many details, but uh, we have a number of tactical sensors in our network that can detect uh, specific kinds of breaches. And we work in partnership with um, the Center of Internet Security, as well as um, CISA with the Department of Homeland Security in, in terms of uh, monitoring these systems. So I do have what's called a, a SOC, a security operations center, it's 24-7, uh, that monitors um, these sensors for us. So we do get the tickets and we respond to the tickets. So far we haven't had any, any major uh, penetrations that we couldn't handle that had, had uh, taken any data. I think you're explaining what, what you showed me that one time that whenever there's any potential threat or someone even like, you know, peeking through the, you know, the, the curtains that uh, your, your system basically detects it, like a certain number of uh, threats in, in that particular uh, area. And, but, you know, I, I've seen that, but is there any like an SOP or a, a plan that needs to be in place? And, if this is the only plan that you have, I mean, considering how we're going so much more into technology and using, you know, the cyber world, um, that there, are you comfortable enough that you have enough software 
and protections in, in place, protecting the 40 uh, line agencies that you have under your, your, uh, under your protection. <laughs> uh, Senator, to answer that question, frankly, uh, there's nobody in my position that would ever feel comfortable in this world about, no matter how many tools you have, um, you know, if there's- but are there are things out there that can be offered to yeah. add a little bit more security. I know mm -hmm. there never could be, but. Well, when it comes to security, the more resources we could pour to it, the better. Uh, and that's always the challenge. It's, it's, a, it's something that loots back to us and it goes back to my challenge on, on the fact that we have, uh, we're short in our IT workforce. Um, we have the people, if we had the people, it would be better. If we, we, have, we have the software, we have the, some partnerships that are in place that can help us, but uh, am I comfortable with the, the current protections? Uh, I'm comfortable, but we're, we're do, I'm comfortable that we're doing the most that we can with the resources we have. I'm not comfortable that we're, you know, um, we don't have the resources outside to, to you know, that, that can, you know, uh, well, then let me put it act this way, as Frank. an investment. The, some autonomous agencies like GWA, GPA, they have their own security systems in place. In fact, you don't oversee that, those agencies that are autonomous that the, the chairman mentioned about. Um, do you think that you're, you, have more of a, you have a better security system set up to monitor any kind of breach or anything like that? better than those the autonomous agencies have? Uh, I don't want to say whether they're better or not. I know we, we have sensors, we, we have technology that is, that it, you know, from our firewall to our sensors, those are kind of the, you know, um, the frontline pieces of technology that, that we, you know, that we, we're using today. Um, I don't, I know that uh, when it comes to the other autonomous agencies out there, um, they have even more challenges when it comes to protecting um, things that are outside their their network, their infrastructure. Uh, you know, um, in the power grid or the water side, um, that's even much more complex to protect. Do you oversee Reven Tax? I'm sorry? Do you take care of Revin taxes, security, cybersecurity? Yes, we do. I mean, that has a lot of important information and data, social security numbers, et cetera. That's like big time information. You yes. know? So, I mean, if, if, you know, it's always that question, then if OT, especially this very nice building put together, why isn't OT also overseeing the autonomous agencies? The autonomous, autonomous agencies, they have more money, believe it or not, than line agencies. And they seem to, you know, not only provide higher salaries for, for their employees, but, you know, have the best buildings, et cetera, down the line, that why can't OT take advantage of that and bring them in to uh, your department, you know, these agencies? Why has that never been done? Uh, Senator, uh, right now, it's not one of the questions I ponder on with the, with the autonomous agencies, only because their lines of business are, are specific. For example, if they're a port, you, you, you stick to lines of business that are w within the context of the port of your power. Um, they're all driven by, you know, how they're, they're siloed. When we talk about, you know, the 41 agencies that I support, they're all different lines of, of business. So if I had more people, uh, if we brought them all together and collaborated, it, it really kind of depends on how we, you know, we, we approach it. I, I think it would be ideal. It probably would be an ideal situation, but uh, I don't know if it would change much if, if those resources were, were fully consolidated. It would be nice to find out if it could and try to put a plan together to see if that will work. It's obvious that there, there need to be some more SOPs and yeah. plans in place as the world is changing quickly, you know, in the fastest fiber optic cable, you know, I'm not a tech guru. Just the last two questions. In your uh, proposal that we received from BBMR might have changed, but you had two vacancy positions. That is fund that you incorporated funding for, which is uh, 106385 Is that 
um, incorporated in your budget that you provided us today for the uh, um, 2.6 million, 25833? Is this in the personnel? This is the, um, yeah, this is the data processing manager, computer system analyst. Team. Yes. Okay, that is in your budget, correct? That's correct. Okay, but the other areas that you hear that uh, something that's important as a computer system analyst as well as security, an informational security officer, um, as well as a service officer, system analyst one and two, program coordinator, I think that's uh, systems program. There's no f money amount here. so. It's obvious you, you didn't incorporate that, but why didn't you include these positions into your request as far as needing the money? I mean, you, of course you put their names, the positions, but you didn't incorporate the funding for this. So that means to me, you didn't ask for these positions, but yet they're incorporated. Uh, that's a little bit of a tricky question. There. Uh, I, I think, truthfully, to testify, there was numbers in there. There were numbers in there. What was that amount? I, I can't recall the amount. Well, I'd appreciate it, Frank, if you get at this, those numbers, because this is an area that everybody needs to be very conscious of. This okay. is the world that is changing vastly. So if we can get those numbers on these particular, there's one, two, three, four, five, six positions here. Uh, without any um, funding requested for, but the positions are there. So I greatly appreciate if you can give to the, the oversight chair. Yes, and, uh, Senator. And CC, myself, please, I'd, I'm curious to, to look at that. I really, really am concerned about this agency and it's not being able to have the uh, funding you need to, to keep Guam safe, so. I understand. I'm, oh, and, oh and I'm sorry. I'm, yeah. I'm concerned with those two. Yeah, we should all be. <laughs> Next thing you know, we're, we're held ransomware, you know, ransom. But uh, last one, Mr. Chair, I don't know, is, um, did you say how much this uh, new uh, building was going to cost? Uh, no, I don't have the cost on that. The, the, okay, that's all I have. The, the drawings were just for the vision side of it. Okay, and, yeah, that's uh, all I have. Thank you for now. Thank you, welcome. Mr. Chair. Thank you, Frank. Senator Brown. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I, I certainly appreciate the presentation this afternoon, but I did want to ask, I mean, you said you had about, what, 16 employees or so? Is that about what you have, your current uh, staffing capacity? That's correct. And you had mentioned on your utilities, it's about $277,000. Uh, what is the bulk of that for? Is it for your power bill, I'm assuming? Uh, part, the two pieces of it are, the main parts are power for the, for the data center. And the second part is actually the telecom side, which has, which actually the data circuits that, uh, that, uh, you know, from the, from the, the broadband that we have to support. I see. So, so the bulk of this is for the operations of your computer systems and things of that nature. That's yeah, correct. I, mean, that's, I thought, wow, if I divide that per, per employee, that's a pretty high power bill. Um, with regards to your new building that you included here, there wasn't as much. What, what is the plan for this? Is this something that's funded? Is it you're looking for funding? I mean, conditions uh, don't get we're, drawn up. We're for exploring no uh, grants or our approaches to to leverage federal grants. The the you know, the, there's a lot of opportunity to um, to look for grants, that, you know, sure. uh, that are coming up to beef up infrastructure, and and I think because. I feel because uh, where we're located today, we're in a flood zone. Uh, we're, we're, we're in a flood zone too, yeah. Our data center is in a flood zone. <laughs> yeah. This is in a flood zone. Uh, our, our building's over 60 years old. Mm -hmm. uh, the, um, I, 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 I kind of tell the, the humorous side of things when, uh, when the department administration's building was being demolished, I had to kind of, I had to stand outside our building to make sure the wrecking ball didn't come on our side because mm -hmm. uh, they were, they were focused on trying to get rid of our building too and with, with all of us still in it. So uh, it's pretty old and we, um, we're looking forward to just at least the, the vision of, uh, you know, moving into a new da data center uh, in the future. Do you have a site location of where you're, where you're looking at locating the facility here? 
I've, uh, I've talked to the director for the Department of Land Management, and we're looking at a d number of different locations, uh, including the possibility of where the, the, um, the new hospital may, may be going in that, in that area. There, there's um, there, there's uh, quite a bit of land in that area, and I think it would be appropriate if we could find uh, about, I think it would take about two and a half acres for, for our building. I mean, it's all good to be planning forward, to, certainly to address the needs. And, you know, as Senator Tello mentioned, I mean, we're, we're living in a different world. It's almost an invisible world. It's not tangible that we can sit and touch, but, but certainly the movement of information is, is critical and being able to keep it where you need it and, and making sure it's not invaded uh, from the outside. Because as she mentioned, we are seeing almost daily reports. I mean, major multi-billion dollar companies are being hacked. Governments in the world are being uh, you know, and, and being held for uh, money or exploiting the information that they're obtaining. So I, I appreciate the information. I was just a bit curious, uh, and certainly if you are able to find other sources of funding to address construction, I think it would be, be a very, very good thing. Other than that, I don't have any other questions. I mean, I think your presentation was pretty, pretty basic in terms of your operation and, and very straightforward. So, so thank you very much for providing that this afternoon. Thank, thank you, so Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Brown. Senator Atta. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good afternoon, Frank. Uh, nice to see you again after a afternoon, while. Senator. It's amazing how uh, OTEC has come to this day and age, huh? from a division to a bureau to now the Office of Technology. And I think you, you had a very, very big role in that in moving uh, technology forward in our government. And, where, where do you see OTEC in perhaps maybe the next two years with, if you had additional resources, you know, to, where, where would you like to see OTEC be in, you know? Well, I, there's a number of things. If we, if we had the resources, we'd be, we will, we'd be looking into um, the relevance of leveraging, um, you know, the cloud, for example, um, how it'd be relevant out here. You know, there's there's a lot of <clears throat> there's there there's a lot of different things to explore, including the fact that uh, because of the global pandemic, uh, many many things uh, in the IT side need to transform. Uh, the transformation includes, you know, um, an an acceleration, if you will, of uh, of how you use the data and how you know and and how you even uh, look at data today. I mean, uh, the we saw a, a, a really big spike on the use of our online systems for something simple as as the you know vehicle registration. Um, that was only getting a trickle of people going on and on and. Uh, registering on an online basis um, uh, for many, many years. And that system had been available for, you know, at least uh, the last five or six years. And uh, we basically, we saw a lot of spike activity in all those particular kinds of applications. So where I see our role is, is, is into assisting and delivering the services for those kinds of applications. And also just transforming our business. Uh, when we look at the departments, uh, there should be, you know, any place that a, a um, citizen has to, has to visit, there needs to be digital signage out there. There, need, there needs to be more um, queuing systems that are out there that, uh, that help in managing, um, you know, the wait times that are in each one of these areas. And I'd like to, you know, have our team more active in looking at and exploring the way we're, um, you know, way we're working with uh, with each one of these agencies and how they're handling their, handling their business. So, you know, when you contrast the autonomous agencies, it's pretty straightforward. If you're doing power, it's customer service and power. If it's water, it's water and power. Um, if you're at the hospital, it's it's their you know their, it's their health management systems. Um, and, you know, they're fairly siloed, but when you look at the Office of Technology, again, we've got a lot of opportunities, and there's not one, um, 
you know, one cookie cutter kind of, uh, um, what is it, application that's available. We, we need to look at outside the box and just work to transform the business and how we're, uh, how we're doing things out there today. Thank you for that. And you know, right there, just that right there was the ARP funding. You know, I mean, that, that's great. And I hope that you get the funding that you need to, to make that come to fruition because it is important and technology is very important in this modern day and age. Uh, I mean, like you just said, vehicle registration, you, you go up to DMV previously. Now you can just go to the inspection station, go there, register, uh, have your vehicle inspected and they can do that process for you. So it just goes to show where technology has been over the past several years. And, and I hope that the funding that you requested from the governor for the ARP, that you're able to take technology even beyond that now and do the things that you just said that you want to see in the next two years, because that's exactly how long the funding will be. It was probably in the next two to three years, right? So I thank you for that, Frank. I, I mean, I'm not sure whether you, know, you, were, you were told, well, you can't, you can't discuss what the... Uh, what the, the plan is or how much and things like that, or you were given a gag order, I don't know. But what I'm saying is these are the things that we need to know because the people need to know what is it that our government is doing for them in this day and age? And what is it that we are doing with the money that is coming in from the federal government to help, to help the people? And you know, yesterday I was just kind of taken back when one director didn't want to answer and because it's, you know, it's not the, the appropriation of the legislature, but it's taxpayer money. And the last time I checked, I have kids that stay in the states that pay taxes back there. So, yes, I like to know what their taxpayer money is paying for. So, you know, transparency, accountability, and honesty to the people, I believe, is what we need to look for. And thank you, Frank, for, for that, and I appreciate it. The other, the other uh, question I had is, you have here on your contractual for... Uh, one point about one million uh, forty one thousand well, what does that cover on your contractual uh, well the the contractual covers a number of different things most of it is is um, software licensing um, uh, another big chunk of it is hardware uh, maintenance mm -hmm. so literally all, all that most of it is is there and even with that it's still it's still short in terms of what we have to license and and uh, how we need to maintain our our systems uh one thing you know i want to note that's is a major concern is that since the you know since the tra the trump tax cut uh we have not had any investments in capital uh at the at our data center so you know, in terms of our storage, our memory, our servers, we're working with what we have. Uh, and all of those are actually coming out of support with the manufacturer, so we can't even find uh, maintenance for these systems until, until we upgrade. So that's a major concern. Uh, we continue to have our challenges, and, but we're, again, we're gonna be doing the best we can to keep our systems up and running. And hopefully you'll be able to use some of that ARP money, the ARP money to, to invest into that so that you know, we can take technology uh, that much further. Do you have any um, prior year obligations in your office? Uh, prior year, I... Unpaid. I, well, if we do, we've spent it all. Let's see. So okay. the, I, I know uh, we've, uh, uh, we've kind of balanced it out. So whatever we had shortfalls for this fiscal year, we we tried to use uh, what we didn't spend in a lot in the previous fiscal year. Okay, thank you. And you know that uh, I believe Senator Brown just had a bill passed that required that would be requiring the um, the public hearings or you know agencies that have hearings to be uh, broadcast. Would you be able to assist the agencies and uh, departments in ensuring that they adhere to that public uh, that that legislation to ensure that? Um, all public hearings are, are broadcast on their website and that they have the, the technology or at least give them the information that they need to purchase the technology to uh, ensure that we have a, uh, a public hearing that can be broadcast via their website or on the social media platforms. But 
you know, we don't, we don't want something off your phone that, you know, you'll be shaking every three seconds that, you know, and uh, I hope that you'll be playing a, a big part in that. Uh, I hope I will too, because part of, part of uh, broadcasting within the government premises to also assure the security side of it and that they're not breaching any of our systems. So there's the public side that will, will go out and then there's the, there's a side that needs to be secured. So uh, I assure you we'll be, we'll be actively in, engaged in assuring at least that part of it and, and their connectivity. Uh, that's great to hear. Thank you so much again for your budget presentation and you know, we look forward to assisting you where we can and how we can. And you know, we know that if you're secured, we're secured, right? So, and the people of Guam will be secured as well. So thank you very much. Mr. Chairman, thank you for the opportunity thank you, for Senator. these questions. Thank you, Senator Atta. Senator Tidego, you had a follow-up question? I did, thank you, Mr. Chair. And you know, Frank, I know where you can find or advocate for $5 million for OTEC. Show up tomorrow at 11 o'clock because we're having a public hearing on resolution, on this resolution we put together and we put $5 million for OTEC. So come on down and uh, advocate for that ARC, ARC funding that we set aside. <laughs> okay. I know if he's allowed to, right? <laughs> but come on down. Show us how much you want to push for it. <laughs> the other, I just real quick, how much money do you have now currently from grants that you received within uh, 2020, 2021 in the bank right now? Uh, well, in terms of grants, uh, we're actively engaged in two, two major grants. I think they, they tune, uh, both of them are just under a million dollars, I'd say. That Probably you have around closer in the to bank about right 800,000. Okay. Have you earmarked those already? Yes, they're actually spent okay. already. We're, we're using that to beef up our, our power infrastructure as well as our, the resilience of our data center. And the, the, uh, is that funding that came from BSP? You know, I know BSP has some grant money, right, that's been working with you. Is that part of that money? Uh, no, it, this is actually it coming, it was, it's an OI. It's uh, Office of Interior Affairs, okay. uh, one of the TAP grants. So okay. we had, we were fortunate to get two TAP grants in, in the How about uh, in BSP? The previous years. What about, what about BSP? Uh, they, is there a grant out there that they're working with to give you uh, OTEC funding? Uh, we're, we're collaborating with them on an IT needs assessment grant that they have. Oh, okay. And that's through and processed, ready to go, right? Uh, that's ongoing. The, okay, ongoing. The, that's now. already okay. been awarded, and uh, okay. we're we're in the we're working on the tactical activities right now. Your uh, one other thing I just thought about your generator. Uh, what is the status on your generator? Because you know you have to have power. If the power to go out, you got to have your generator. How's that uh, coming along? What's the status of? Well, you know, our, our generator is old. It's functional. Right. Uh, it's got a bad muffler, but uh, it's still <laughs> functional right now. And what and is so the estimated cost? We're doing cost? our best to keep it maintained. Right. And what is the estimated cost if you had to replace that generator? Uh, gosh, I, I haven't really okay, well, gone into that. Give us part. that number two, because I think there's an issue with your generator. And uh, <laughs> your OT, you have to have power regardless. So yes. if you can provide the, a number to the chairman as well, I appreciate it. And don't forget, 11 o'clock tomorrow, come and advocate for $5 million <laughs> okay. from our resolution tomorrow. <laughs> okay? Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Tidegui. Uh If there are no other questions, this committee will conclude uh, this afternoon's budget hearing. Just as a reminder, the committee will continue to receive testimonies for the next few days. Please address your written testimony to the Committee on General Government Operations, Appropriations, and Housing and submit it via email to Senator Joe San Augustine at gmail.com or to his office located at the Rand Care Building, second floor, suite 3761 South Marine Corps Drive, Timuning, Guam 96931. Sidzus Masi, thank you everyone for your attendance and participation in today's hearing. And for those at home, thank you for watching. This budget hearing on Bill 55-36-COR relative to the Office of Technology is now adjourned at 4.10 p.m. Thank you.